through Facebook so I did this with Seda as well and I looked for photos and I have one of us I have to, I have to download it as we speak no problemo first of all just what has been happening with you since we last said goodbye yeah I I applied to film school uh-huh. in Canada um, but it was more like a university with a film course rather than a film school oh, specifically okay. and I went there. I went to Manitoba, mm-hmm. Winnipeg, which was yeah. uh, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as happening as like it's not. It's not as happening as like Vancouver or ah. Toronto, you know. So it, it was a bit slow, mm-hmm. and um, I, I was there for about like nine months because mm-hmm. I realized that I wanted to focus specifically on the art of creating film rather than having to do like biology courses and math courses, mm-hmm. which I felt I didn't, I didn't want to do. I mean, mm-hmm. especially coming from A-levels where I, ha- I could choose the subjects. So I was like, ah, oh, now I have to do this all over again. I just want to do film. And then from there, I came back home. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And then from home, I joined ADMI, which is Africa Digital Media okay. Institute. And at the time, they were still a little small, but right now they're much bigger, mm-hmm. which is great, which means a lot of people are allowing their kids at least to be in the arts and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, I joined that. I was there for two years. I studied film and television production. And wow. after that, I have my diploma, yeah. <laughs> valedictorian. Wow, <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I then began, what did I do afterwards? It was my first job. My first job was as a production assistant um, at Ginger Inc. Okay. And then, yeah, I did, I was a production assistant there. I admittedly was not very good at it <laughs> because I had to towards the end of my um, second year at EDMI, I'd figured that I wanted to do writing specifically. So, I mean, I did get into a production assistant. Um, that's how I entered the industry, which wasn't too bad because I got to understand the behind the scenes, which I didn't feel I was too aware of. I think a lot of the times it's all theory until you really see it on paper. So, I, I mean, I was there for only about like three months. Mm-hmm. and in the very same year that I left Mm -hmm. I didn't work for about a couple of months Mm -hmm. as I was trying to figure out okay where should I go where should I go to get started with writing I was Mm -hmm. so confused because Mm -hmm. there wasn't necessarily any structures that were there that could say well this is the first place that you could go to but luckily a friend of mine um, one of the only other girls in the classes that we were doing I think by the time I was finishing we were three Mm -hmm. out of a class of I don't know how many only three girls Mm -hmm. and um, she sent me a link about people looking for writers and then that's how I got to be um, uh, I went through the interview process and mm-hmm. then that's how I got my first writing job uh-huh. uh, and then ended up being the yeah it was really fun we just did a really fun interview so it is a German Kenyan co-production um, called Country Queen mm-hmm. well that's a tentative title I don't know if they're still going with that now and then I ended up being the lead writer there and I was there for a, a bit of time as I did the pilot mm-hmm. um, so that was my first one <laughs> yes that is the first part, chapter one. Okay, chapter two. I left um, uh, Country Queen later on. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel that it was the right fit for me also, but I'd gotten quite a lot of experience. I met so many people, such as the actress in Kanze Matella, and she was fantastic. She was in the industry for much longer than I was and had really good insight to a lot of these things. And she already had a company she'd started called... 8278A Mm -hmm. and she really wanted to start it up again with more content and really be able to give writers or people who hadn't quite had the chance to fight against like you know the big three stations Mm -hmm. or um, certain people to really diversify what you can um, do in terms of film and television 
So um, we became friends and we started working together from then. Uh, so as we were planning, as she was planning that, I was also doing, um, I applied again, strangely enough, to Ginger Inc. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but this time I went as a writer. So it's a lecture through a workshop process that they have, which is very vigorous. Um for a new television series that they were doing and yeah so that is my second writing project so i've been on writing projects like that i've only done two and well to most people it may seem very few they were very long and very involving and so it was interesting seeing how that is being done from like quote unquote the western side of things that's how we used to mm-hmm. think of like ah, i just do the show chop chop it's mm-hmm. there yeah and yeah so and then of course covid happened <laughs> yeah yeah we've been sort of uh how do i say it's, it's sort of like taken us to all yeah. mm-hmm. i want to get back to like the beginning of you knowing that writing was mm-hmm. was the thing that you want to do how did that happen? What inspired you? What films? Uh, what writers? Was it, was it books? Was it reading? Yeah. Just, yeah. All right. From, I mean, it may sound really cliche, but I think the easiest way you can know you're a writer is if you're a reader. Mm-hmm. No, it's true. <laughs> there is no one without the other. Yeah. Um, and from when I was very young, I always read voraciously Mm -hmm. and my introduction to reading was through a lot of the penguin classics that were always there from the little women's and the secret gardens you know Mm -hmm. and i really enjoyed those and but hadn't quite gotten into writing until i was about 13. uh a a friend of my sister's my older sister was writing a book and it was by hand like oh (laughs) she was writing it by hand (laughs) yeah so I was so impressed. I didn't know that this is something that could be done. I was so excited and decided that I could actually do it because I enjoyed doing my essays. But for some reason, I didn't quite put two and two together. Mm-hmm. And so I began to write like my books from then on. And then I'd give it to my friends and mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's even once I got busted. I feel pain because I never finished that book. Because <laughs> it got confiscated in the middle of a science class. But anyway, um, from there... I went on to, you know, I mean, like university, no, that was primary school. And then in high school is when I really, because before then I was kind of stuck on, yeah, you know, I'll be a lawyer, because that's kind of like the thing that happens when yeah. you're a good writer and you know exactly how to put down your words on paper. Mm-hmm. Somehow, a lot of people tend to push you towards law. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, in my opinion, mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel that there are a lot of writers in law and a lot of creatives in law, but there just wasn't, I guess, the space to um, explore that. So the effort they ended up that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily for me, I decided, well, I would want to write, and my parents really supported me during that time. The, my mom was so enthusiastic. She was like, yes, buy this writing course and do this and do that. And that was when I knew I'd wanted to be a writer. So I guess that's also part of what informed my decision, especially through the Canada move, which was like, I want to write. I don't want to study bio right now. I've already done that for like 12 years. (laughs) Um, Yeah. uh, Yeah, that's it. I think it's a beautiful thing when you when you when you have uh, the backing of your parents to do what it is that you want to do. Uh. Um, Uh Yeah, because it's it's uh, it's not too understandable to say i just want to write because there'll be a lot of follow-up questions like with with writing i think there's so much follow-up questions where it's like with a lawyer it's like we've seen them okay we know what they do doctors we know what they do um nurses we know what they do uh but like Mm -hmm. that uncertainty with creatives is like hmm uh doubtful a little bit for for families so i'm glad that you had like the push um and what do you (laughs) what do you gravitate uh towards what what had you started what was your first writing uh themes or genres like what had you felt comfortable in the beginning writing and how has it changed from then till now are you do you find yourself still writing the same kind of things kind of stories you know what's compelling to you and what do you want to convey in your writing? Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think when I first started writing, I was very much involved in my little world. So um, I, I think the the words right now would be middle grade fiction. So you know, like in primary school, grade school, like oh, you know, my friends and this is what we're doing and blah blah blah. And mm-hmm. then later on, moved to what we'd now call young adult. Mm-hmm which is more of high school and what's happening there. But I was also heavily influenced that during that time um, with the show that I was watching, which I think, by the way, was the best time, you know, because we were getting Nanachuano, we were getting yeah. Veronica Mars, we were getting all of these like, interesting shows, Rosewell, and I was like, oh, there was so much material. Yeah. So I tried to, you know, spice it up a little with that. Uh, however, when I decided to write it, I thought then, because I liked writing, I would be very open to very many genres. But, you know, you can't be a master of all the things that you do. So while I do enjoy reading the genres, I had to really, really sit down and figure out what it is that I liked writing, what were the themes. And for me, that was mysteries and thrillers, because I had a way of taking a very innocent situation and suddenly it it had turned into a thriller, you know. (laughs) So I therefore figured that I was probably more comfortable, happier writing mysteries and thrillers for both adult audiences and young adult audiences, um, which is something that I'm still doing today, both in script form and prose, and in script form and in prose form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really excited, actually, to have been a, a writer on the podcast you're the first one and the yes. fact that <laughs> the fact that um in the past few days just like looking over uh what you what you're doing and um the things that i think we have in common in terms of like the writing world uh it's really exciting for me so I- yeah so i just want to find out like since um, I had no idea that you'd gone into film, it was? No? I, d- I didn't go into film. Okay, this is I'm completely confused, I'm sorry. It's okay, <laughs> don't worry. I went, uh, so after uh, Rushinga, I actually went to go on and study oh. uh, sciences. I was like, oh yes, I actually remember that. Exactly. Yeah, so I didn't actually know how I wanted to be in the creative world. I mean, I had written a lot, I was writing a lot even in university oh. so i thought that maybe that's what i i would do uh, long story short i i quickly uh-huh. found out that i was interested in so many other things like i just ju- my mind just jumps around and i couldn't uh pinpoint exactly what uh-huh. i wanted to do at one time like I, I like for three months i can concentrate on something and then i would move into another idea that either involved other people or i don't know yeah it was really it, it, it's a it was a good choice because i could also be as vague and undecided and non-streamlined as i can't possibly be like i can i can uh-huh. under that name i gave myself the permission to be allowed to figure myself out through my work and not be and not have the pressure to be consistent with the name or, or certain kind of theme or genre or thing uh-huh. that I did. So it was a good move. And and it just kind of grew from there. I would get up on stage and do whatever it is that I wanted to do with my writing. If I'm, I'm accompanying it with someone else, accompanying it with music, or it's just me talking. And I would do that on the regular. And then other people started joining in. And then the community joined in. And then it just... And then after that, I was like, maybe we should just also do visual art. So then I ventured into exhibitions with people and and experimenting how I wanted to dissect my on how I wanted to dissect my my stories and my mm-hmm. my um, yeah. So so I can tell it in like a Manila paper drawing. I can tell it in a short poem. I can tell it in a short film script. I mean, unlike you, I've just written things. I haven't actually, that nothing has, like in terms of film, I, I love, I've loved films for a very long time and I, and I very early on, like immediately I discovered that they were scripted, like these things are scripts, because I thought they were just magical things <laughs> that appeared in TV. And then, um, and then, and then I don't know where I found out that, oh, there's a script uh, behind everything, because I would, 
listen to the actors saying but you know when i read the script for this i was like what is this script that they're talking about and then afterwards i um yeah i kind of just got into the idea of knowing how words turn into visuals mm-hmm. and so this that, that was kind of a little bit of my introduction of, of all like my obsession with uh making something come alive in a script but i nothing actually since then has actually come alive i'm just i've just been experimenting on on how i can i can do i can share my stories also in a in a in a film script um as opposed to monologues and poetry and things like that oh, that's very interesting i mean it's, it's interesting it's like I, I seem so settled in on one ro- route like i'm just going with this route and then you're like oh okay, i like this i like this and i think that that's very nice because mm-hmm. sometimes what i find is that a lot of people will try to peg you down mm-hmm. as one specific thing mm-hmm. um like you're and, and it's something that you can struggle with throughout your career you're like am i a script writer or am i a writer mm-hmm. and then coming to the idea that I write mm-hmm. so I whatever format that is available exactly. to me that I can actually do that is really cool mm-hmm. I want to find out more about like what you thought about um, being in those spaces and what it's like even in Arusha for instance yeah um, yeah in in the in the creative spaces you mean um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ooh, Arusha is quiet <laughs> Let's if I if I was to put it yeah. that way, it's very quiet. It's it's definitely not like Dar es Salaam, which is much more vibrant and happening, and it's definitely not like Nairobi, where there's like all these avenues to do things. Um, yeah, uh-huh. for for me here, like I said, when I when I arrived back from university, and I wanted, I I actually didn't want to start the annoying artist. I wanted to find another place where I can just go on the regular and figure myself out there, but there was just nothing happening on the regular um just just not not a not a very actively uh creative movement you know like i like you know you'd have a few things and i and i think um it was also a lot of musical performances so like i mean oh. music and things like that that's that's happening you, you know um for example, Alliant Frances uh, did a, you know, c- and continues doing very great shows where they invite musical performance artists. Um, and at that time, that was what was happening. I didn't even know about it. But outside that, and you know, because also with institutions, or organizations like that, there's also, um, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that it attracts a certain type of people. So, so it wasn't as diverse as I would love it to be. <laughs> It wasn't <laughs> inclusive like yes. for me i felt yes, like i understand exactly <laughs> so um at least at that time i think it's gotten better now this was like the first time i'm growing up in arusha because i grew up uh, elsewhere in east africa um and i would just come here to visit and for holiday so this was really the time where like i've decided i'm settled here this is my city now and i have to make the most of my time to, uh, with it you know and so mm-hmm. not seeing that that big part of me that i want to experiment on or experience there is no active surrounding to nurture that i decided to just take matters mm-hmm. in my hand how do you go like do you run any programs do you do collaborative efforts with other east african artists yeah. or the other tanzanian artists yeah i mean all of the above in the beginning um it was all about getting my name out there in terms of what the annoying artist yeah. is which is also something i don't have a clear answer to um it was a lot of like me writing a lot and performing and then rotating around the city because i i kind of wanted to also have a feeling of bringing people together from all corners of the city because i felt like people were just stuck in their own corners of the city and they would do whatever would happen there and they will never come to this like uh-huh. to another side of the city that was the beginning of it right so little by little the beginning was just about like getting out the word and then yeah. later it was i think after people caught up to what it is that i'm trying to do um it became a collaboration for sure so of course then we would oh nice we would 
Yeah, I mean it was it was really great. I I, I got to see the Arusha community um, crave this kind of thing, but also actively contribute. And so yeah, we would just have uh-huh. students do things. We would have people who are not even who wouldn't even say wouldn't call themselves creatives or artists perform or share something or yeah initiate something for the for the the annoying artists which i found really cool i think the the thing that opened the door for me to be able to collaborate with for example kenyan and ugandan artists was when i went to when i participated in yali in 2018 i was in ku for like a month but i i had already been looking at so many Kenyan artists and East African artists who were doing things. So when I was in Nairobi, I kind of like sneaked out to go and meet all these people and I would just tell them about what it is that I'm doing. And they were so welcoming and and, and up for things. And that okay. I think snowballs the thing of like, you know, we should do this, we should do that. Uh, you should come to Arusha, uh, do this and that. But um, yeah, most of it has been collaborations with Arusha uh, creatives or Tanzanian creatives. Awesome. I, I like that. I'm all about collaboration. Yeah. But you know what I find really interesting is how it's almost so... Um, the stories, especially when it comes to writing stuff, is very similar. And I'm always very interested in how people execute writing. Because mm-hmm. writing is a very difficult thing to say that you do yep. because essentially when you write it, you just have to be at home with the fact that people don't care. It's like telling people about your dream that you dreamt last night and someone has to be like, yeah, okay, you know. <laughs> and um, there's almost there's almost no infrastructure unless, for instance, you were doing literary fiction, mm-hmm. which I found to be so difficult because I was like, I'm not, I wouldn't place myself to be like, or and Chimamanda or whatever. Mm-hmm. But whereas there were so many other spaces for, let's say, writers in other places that you go to, it's like, okay, if there's poetry, this, 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 this. If you're doing commercial writing, there's this space for you here. And you find that you really have to, even despite Nairobi being like happening and whatnot, you really have to carve out your own space. Mm-hmm. And I really relate to the fact that you're saying you know, you're just reaching out and you're contacting people mm-hmm. because that really is the only thing to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to like reach into your bag and be like, who do I know who's this? And then finding people that you can really work with. And then that just being the first part. And then having them actually sit down and do the administrative thing so you can actually get it out there is another thing. Mm-hmm. Do you have any plans to do an actual film? Like just put, just shoot a film yourself entirely. Mm-hmm. And not just the writing. Yeah. You know how, like, um, there's, like, freshman 15, how, oh, you know, you go into college and you're, like, you gain, like, 15 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, in film school, we'd call it, like, the fresh face, you know? You come in and there's this, like, first term people and they are so excited. We want to shoot, we want to do all of these things. Mm-hmm. And then it gradually starts to die off. Um, the closer you get to graduation because you're like realistically this needs to be something feasible like it needs to be both profitable you need to it tends to become so business like and you're almost not prepared for that and it's, it starts to disappear and you just have to really work towards um, still grabbing on to that because I really did enjoy making like shorts with my um, schoolmates and stuff like that and just putting them out there and there was nothing attached to that and then later on you get it like but then the submissions and this festivals and and there's this and you have to get here and there this award and you're like oh, okay uh, okay and it's not that it can't be done but it's just like oh you know I out of all this I really didn't put in the money back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and um, so yes I really do I, I even have like a couple of things like I said even working with them come there somebody who has done film and television and theater before. Mm-hmm. Her ideas and all of that is like, oh yeah, you can get it happen. She has like a good contact base on who to go to um, and all that. But then still it ends up being the thing of, okay, but we need money for this and money for this and money for this. And we can now really see the system being questioned, especially in a time like now when no one's doing anything, uh, not many sets are running. Not many writers are writing, not many actors are there. And this would be a perfect time, for instance, 
for people to be introduced to your content, to be consuming that content, but because there were so many roadblocks before, it's almost empty and it's insane because you're finding like so many numbers on um, like web series or Netflix or people thinking maybe I should get Amazon Prime, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, in terms of the content that we have curated locally, it's so small. Uh, so during this period, I told myself I really have to get back to like the fresh face. Like when I came in, and I really just wanted to create and trying to reach out to people and seeing, you know, using the taboo word of free, <laughs> you know, and seeing if we can get on on board to create something that could be feasible. Because there's so many ways to try to go around it, and I'm like, it's just so difficult. It takes so much time, mm -hmm. and this is a system that isn't necessarily set up by people who understand. It's for a completely different economy, a completely different type of people. You know, I can't right now be complaining, oh, you know, it's so full of literary fiction, for instance, the scene, where's the commercial fiction? I was like, I'll just create and try to put it out there as much as I can. And I will do the same the moment that we're able to start coming together again for film and for TV because we have really fantastic ideas. And it would be such a shame if it's a thing like, for instance, money mm -hmm. that's getting in the way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but both, both creating things during the lockdown or even before, what were some of the obstacles that you had in putting putting out your art and getting it to people out there um luckily enough i i haven't ever since i started the annoying artist i haven't had to answer to anyone really everything that has held me back has really just been myself um either just anxiety the get-go the dynamic was that okay well if other people are not doing it i'll just do it myself and then they'll join in okay i want i wanted to go and see people read share all the shame and weird stuff to the audience but no one uh -huh. is doing that so i'll just start and say all the embarrassing things about me and make it rhyme and charge for it and then uh maybe people will cut will join in later and so because i started on that foot it's been about trying really to tell myself it's good enough and ready to to release and it doesn't have to be perfect yeah, uh -huh. so I haven't had really that that much. I, I relate with that a lot, and I think that's part of like the the concept behind the fresh film face. You know, mm -hmm. you start off with that, and I really envy you for that for having it all all that time, and then you know getting back to it so quickly. Mm -hmm. If I understood you correctly, mm -hmm. and then because you you start off with it, I think that sort of childish glee and wonder and um, openness to experiment and very many things collaborate it's there and then suddenly you know you get roped into the world of like competition mm -hmm. and the feedback and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. but i think it must be said that it is very overwhelming mm -hmm. especially when you're like okay well it is possible to get my stuff out and then you know the narrative starts to come about like only these specific people can get your stuff to the way it is mm -hmm. and then there's also different narratives about the capabilities of the people um of the artists around you and what it is that they're capable of and then you suddenly start to you know, wrap yourself up like okay then it must be Khan, it must be Sundance, it must mm -hmm. be this and that and then mm -hmm. before long you're not doing anything mm -hmm. and then people will ask you well you're writing and like yes I mean I've written my script but you know, you're not going to give them anything mm -hmm. film is a holistic thing they want to see it mm -hmm. and you definitely want to be part of the process and so even now getting back to this it's like no I must try them I really need to do that because you're like I must return to that. I must return to even being honest with myself and having people just honor that and be like, listen, this is a story, and you, I will pitch it to you, and whether you like it or not, that's it. It doesn't. It shouldn't affect me whether you know whether they, uh, you know, they're like, oh, you know, like any this and that and blah blah blah. It's like just join it and have it at its most pure form. Mm -hmm where join this thing and then see how it goes because even without it for instance if you continue and you want to continue doing submissions because that's not anything wrong you do have a calling card yeah. but if you don't have the calling card and that's the thing that you're going for first you're never going to have anything and then you know you yeah. end up being literally the trope of the writer with like 58 scripts in the back mm -hmm. walking you know being like yeah i'm a writer and then <laughs> like, yeah i mean the point is you're supposed to get it out to the audience exactly so i find that yeah, I find that a lot of artists I feel are returning, well, the ones I'm discussing with, I'm talking to, are returning to sort of that place. So I'm very interested to see 
once um, markets, economies, and stuff like that starts opening up, what it is that people can accomplish. Because like, it, it's weird. It's like a catch-22 situation. Well, not catch-22. It's sort of like an irony where it's, um, it takes you back. It's a terrible situation, but then it takes you back to the beginning and reminds you what you were there for. And perhaps you meet maybe a very more open community, open to trying new things and not getting stuck with the pitfalls that you may find along the way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing your first, your, your short film that you, maybe that you were yeah. able to make here in, uh, during this time, uh, this lockdown. Exactly. You know, it really is because, you know, um, in the investigation of that, sometimes I don't tend to like to use the word like, oh, you know, it's my privilege and stuff like that because I feel like I can get lost in the simplicity and the nuance of what that actually means mm-hmm. uh, because it's different things to different people. Um, but I definitely do think about those things Mm-hmm. Um, even in respect to myself. I mean, I do have the privilege to be where I'm staying and have the support that I'm having, but it makes me wonder, you know, um, if I didn't have any of those structures set in place, would I even have the possibility or the ability to dream of those things myself? And that is also, I think, one of the things that inspires me in terms of collaborative efforts. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, it isn't mine. I'm always welcome in my own home, yeah. <laughs> with my own people, but it isn't mine. And if I had to make it something that's feasible for me, it can't be just feasible for me alone. It has to be feasible for other people. Mm-hmm. So that there's, therefore, a place that you can come. This is a place, this is where you can showcase your art and the thing that you enjoy doing to an audience who's craving for it. But it is also profitable to you, and there's a structure that is in place that doesn't limit you, but allows you to. It allows you for a chance to do all of that stuff. So I'm. It has reminded me. It, it has always followed me, you know, because when you get into the industry, you meet all of these people, and then it's like, okay, you know. The, the, everyone will sort of give you the little side of like, hmm, but you know, you're a little different, you know, you're a bit like this, and you're like, okay, well, <laughs> you can't really refuse because you're not living the same life. But mm-hmm. I, I think those differences shouldn't necessarily divide us. I think it speaks more towards what needs to be done rather than, for instance, like, sitting down somewhere and complaining, which sometimes ends up happening so many times and it's so annoying how people be like, oh my gosh, what is this, what is this, what is this? I mean, of course, if you have a, a government or an economy, a structure that really supports that, it does make it easier. But if, it, if that isn't the case, for instance, today or tomorrow, you can't be like, oh, I have to wait for it. You really have to be the ones to set mm-hmm. that type of thing around and get as many people interested in it as you can. Because I think because you are sort of strong armed, for instance, by like the big three, you're also, they're the ones setting um, how much you should be paid or how much you, and then people now get stuck within this because you're like, well, you know, I need to provide and I need to do this and I need to do this. And I honor those things because sometimes you just have to do what it is to survive and get by, but it shouldn't have to be the case. And those are the small, I think, little ways, small revolutions of um, or disruptions can happen for people and if I mean I definitely encourage for anyone who's going to hear this it's like if you are definitely in a position of privilege somewhat and you're in a position to um, invite people contact people and collaborate with people use it you know use it and you never know exactly what can come out of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hear you. Collaboration is. I mean, I came into this thinking. You know, I had. I also had this sort of like very entitled mindset when I came in. I was like, no one here can do what I can. What I do, like I just. I just <laughs> thought I was like the most creative badass person who's just doing this thing. And I. I mean, and then you. Yeah, my my ego is off the charts. And then I meet people who are obviously better at at things uh, uh, way better i mean um and then and then also just very multidisciplinary and 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 um unconventional and very um they're just very different and and i couldn't you, you you wouldn't be able to tell you you'd kind of judge them and be like this person is like this and then really when you 
talk to them when they come to your show or you or you meet them in other creative spaces and you uh-huh. and you find out the wealth of um um creativity and artistic sides and knowledge and just you know wholesomeness i guess uh really changes <laughs> your 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 perception of why collaborating um why just joint efforts are much better i mean two heads are better than one yeah but you you really have to you ha- if you came from the same if you are from the same mentality that i was in you really it has to be a re- push and an effort that you're like okay um just be quiet um and uh <laughs> listen to people and um yeah that that has truly helped me because also it has helped things move along faster as well um yeah yeah it's just anyways short short stories that i i truly agree with what you said however i uh-huh. um there's the you told me that you're writing a book yes yes <laughs> are we allowed to know what that is about uh, yes yes exactly so now this brings me back to uh, now what are we doing in the COVID situation? Mm-hmm. I was in a space where I felt um, very lost, so to speak, because it's like there was a break on everything. A lot of the projects that I started off with weren't necessarily local productions; they were co-productions, and a lot of them were like German Kenyan productions, German Kenyan this, and the. They, those tend to take out as much time. It's good because at least there's some money there. And you, I guess sometimes you fall into the space of being comfortable with that, mm-hmm. you know, and then you're like, okay, and then I'll make my film like there, you know, I'll, yeah. I'm waiting for it. And yeah. I'll do it here. And then COVID happens and you're there, oh, but I was planning for it. I was waiting. And now you absolutely cannot do it. Mm-hmm. So what do you do with all of this time as a creative? And mm-hmm. I settled into a space of like, okay, I wake up, I eat, and then I think about what I'm gonna eat about <laughs> eat next time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I thought this is this is nonsense. This isn't a life, you know. Mm-hmm. What is going to happen? And it also makes me wonder. I'm like, well, then how feasible was your job before that you thought you were so comfortable with that that you know now is a, a time where you're confused about what you're supposed to be doing. And I retreated back into what I first started doing when I was 13, which is I enjoyed writing. Um, first, it had actually started through like quantitative article writing because you're like, I must stretch online. I know I, I you do because I know words, so then let me see if I can add my this way. And then it takes me back to like, wait a minute, you really do enjoy writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took a couple of courses on that, and then there's this free site, Wattpad, so mm-hmm. people can find me there on Annie's Bay. And you can post your free stories and all of these things. But I was like, by the time that I was posting that, and I was like, maybe 17, 18, was a different time. I was just like, oh, whatever, you know. But I grew as an artist since then. And I'm like, well, what can I do now? <laughs> the possibilities are so endless. Mm-hmm. And now I was introduced to the world of self-publishing and mm-hmm. being an indie author and, and really selling. And so I was like, okay, I'm into this. <laughs> we love mystery. We love YA. Mm-hmm. Let, let's finally put the stuff that we want out there. And so I'm working on two books. One is called The Spectacular and another is called What Happened to Me. Mm -hmm. They are YA mystery thrillers. Mm -hmm. Um, The first one, The Spectacular, is um, it follows a a delinquent kid who's been expunged to the countryside (laughs) (laughs) for, you know, starting off high school, getting expelled. It's kind of like, um, how would I say... Uh, Smallville, but Smallville had a cult in the little town. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and so this young kid who people don't believe and aren't, um, aren't, he does not have the trope of somebody, or the stereotype of somebody anybody should believe. He starts to feel that there's a danger towards his village, and for the first time in his life, he actually then uh, finds his purpose in saving this little town, and maybe he, then he may come to terms and save himself from some of the things that actually led him to where he was in the first place. So that's the first one. Mm-hmm. It's fun. There's um, uh, cults, girls in dresses, very Manson-esque. <laughs> okay. Inspired. I'm having a lot of fun writing that one. Lovely. And the second one is What Happened to Me. Mm-hmm. Is sort of... Um, I did a lot of... Uh, I think towards the end of my primary education, I switched schools a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Um, so first I did boarding school, I boarding school, and then I went to a 
other school, it was a boarding school, day school. But all of the schools I went to, I found it was really interesting that they all had their own cultures and their own systems. Mm-hmm. And what's so strange is that in the spaces where people write or they create, it's like your entire childhood from high school downwards, especially high school, which I think is so formative, is never heard of. You know, aside from like stories, people have a lot of stories, Mm -hmm. but they never, I've never seen it on film. I've never had to read about it in a place where it wasn't preachy or trying to teach me a message, just basically about what that experience was about. Mm -hmm. And it sort of mashes all of those experiences together in the story of five wealthy teens who are who are um, under suspicion of causing the death of a popular teenager. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, let's say, there's a book called One of Us is Lying. It's fantastic by Karen McManus mm-hmm. and Pretty Late Liars. So it, it mixes the, the two things together, what it means like, to be a modern teen, but there's a lot of cyberbullying, cyber hacking. Mm-hmm. And so these teens must unite to find the killer before they're next, you know, because they know well, they seem to think they're not responsible, but there's a secret hiding amongst one of them. So, this is the two works that I'm planning to debut with. I'm planning to, st- I've already started on them, so I'm mm-hmm. trying to see if I can do a double release of both books, like on Amazon and Apple and stuff like that. Audiobook, I don't know, but maybe wow. <laughs> we can collaborate. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, That's fantastic. And yeah, um, um, how far along are you with them? Are they close to finishing or you've just started? I actually just started because before it was the thing was like, okay, oh, I really enjoy this, blah, blah, blah. And then going into the craft of writing once again, because I think it's always good to remind yourself what the muscle is. It's like an athlete to get into the Olympics without training. You are going to fail. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. um, I have started on them and then I went back to reading about it and it's like, I need to do a lot of work Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. terms of fixing the story. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving myself about like 12 weeks, like three months to have a complete from launching and seeing how the system works to finally getting it to readers. But I think I want to take that much time so that I can um, also see, like you were saying as well, it's like, okay, let me try it myself and then see where this goes. Yeah. When it does work out, because it will, <laughs> yes. I want to see if I can also bring on other writers with me, mm-hmm. um, especially Kenyan writers, and see how else we can permeate that sort of space of like online books, ebooks, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. How do you navigate through how or how did you? Because maybe I assume that you have reached that point where you have a distinct voice in your writing. How do you navigate through getting all these influences and then still making it your own um, in your writing? Now, one of the things that a lot of people actually suggest is read a lot. Mm-hmm. Which is great. I so that's the best I can give to you. Don't read a lot, but I don't know if it's me or other people have this weird habit where you know you can sit down and be like, okay, I'm reading a Stephen King book now, and when you sit down to write, like after you sound like him on the page, Kabisa. like you're a response. Yeah, have you said, okay, yes, I'm not alone. Amen. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So what I tend to do, especially when it comes to voice, is even if I'm reading. Or listening to it on an audiobook or whatever, I try to separate myself from the work and try to look at what I'm reading through the eyes of a writer. So what exactly is it about their voice? How do they tend to get, go around these things? And then use those things in comparison to what I was doing. And then through that, I realized, of course, because of scripting, I think they sort of, if you're multidisciplinary, they sort of merge into each other. I figured out that the visual aspect, the descriptive aspect has always been there for me. How it comes across to the page, how the words jump alive to, it almost feels cinematic when you're reading it. Um, so that's one of the ways that I found my words by actually doing something else <laughs> um, rather than prose. That was one of the ways. And then two, um, I, don't, I, I don't, do you ask something about like the okay, I'm confused, there was voice. So I think I answered that question. Yeah, but I think yeah, I'll say for something sure. else. But I'll, finish a letter to me first. I agree with the with the idea or the feeling of sounding like someone else after you have read someone else and and I 
kind of tried to delude myself into thinking, well, that's just that's just what influence is. They just they've just influenced me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, because I think I would also get stories not just from reading, but also just get stories from being told stories in films, right? I mean, you can. Yeah. I watched a lot of Woody Allen films just because I think they they were the closest to non-linear things that I had seen at the time. And they were very, um, I just loved the freedom um, that it seemed to have and all these different characters just doing things that felt random but was significant to like the entire film or the comic side of the film. and. But also just the simplicity of things. It wasn't. It wasn't always about solving such a huge problem. Mm-hmm. Or it was. It's it, like most of his movies. Uh, at least far like uh, earlier movies were were really just about having fun <laughs> during the whole film, or like like getting the girl, mm-hmm. but having fun um, through that. So I think that introduction to his films. Um, it would so binge watching that i would i would think about a lot of of things that i knew were like have like 90 percent just heavily influenced by him but i was i was excusing myself like that's just what influence is so i would think about all these things that weren't really how i would i mean i was picturing how i would enjoy a film not how i would write the film and so I would, mm-hmm. I would, do you get what I mean? Because I, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so it was the same thing when I read, it was the same thing when I saw, like, even music videos that were really, really uh, either simple or complex or like said something, like just everything I would, I would picture that, but I would never picture it in my own voice. Um, but then I excused it for some reason. And then later, I think I, yeah. I um yeah listening to of course of course I think it's really important to also um those people that you look up to or you admire or inspire you like when they give talks or interviews and they talk about their process processes of things um uh listening to how they found their voice and be like oh it's not about it wasn't yeah it was a really a singular um alone thing that they figured out themselves uh and therefore have to do the same i don't know if that makes sense so i started um yeah i just started i started trying to write as simply as i could just describing so that i was listening to i know i was reading um uh advice from a guy called Ted, Ted, uh-huh. Ted, Ted you Cole. you know him right uh, yeah yeah of yeah course. <laughs> of course and yeah just his um advice to writers and to to people who are yeah trying to i guess trying to find their own voice um and and listening to that really helped in terms of just don't try to make it such a big scene just describe what's in the room (laughs) um and describe it as as how you as as Rukia would talk in your most comfortable space like when who, uh-huh. who I would picture like the person who I'm so comfortable with like comfortable kabisa um and how I would just talk to them you know how I would like uh-huh. go here and then come back and then be like oh but then but then you know this like and then just put that and then of course edit it later but I would really kind of uh-huh. I, I I think my road to finding how I like to write and how I like to sound <laughs> came from um, yeah, experimenting on the idea of speaking to someone I'm really comfortable with and just telling them uh-huh. telling them that story and talking as if yeah, just talking as if uh, yeah, just uh-huh. wandering in my head and come back not really trying to craft us later w- with the edit yes, but in the beginning uh yeah thinking about how i yeah thinking about that <laughs> no I, I i mean i completely get it because um you touched on something very important where it's like how to dissect yourself from influences in your work 
to how does that influence you to a level where you're so crippled you start to this self-doubt that creeps in you're like oh you know um Mm-hmm. I think it's very interesting and one of the ways I've started to come over this is unfortunately <laughs> and I say unfortunately I'm sorry to all those who do but I absolutely cannot read non-fiction I am really? not a person <laughs> but what I found is that there's a lot of um what do you call it? A lot of wisdom that's given through this the this spaces and through those books. And I, I really like the ones that have them with exercises. Just to exercise yourself in that way. So while I may read the film, I may watch the film, I will then go and then study the craft. So that um, craft I think is one of the easiest ways or really exercising craft is one of the easiest ways to find a voice because then you can now start looking at everything through the lens of craft you're like oh i see what he did there oh i like what he did mm-hmm. there i mean it does make film watching or reading a bit of a you're there oh no no i already figured it out no 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 <laughs> and then um, <laughs> it does make it a bit of a, a, a drab but what i like about it is that it does make you much better and then of course practice and practice and practice mm-hmm. and suddenly like there it is and it's shining glory what Rakia or Annette has written and finally it's there because mm-hmm. it's only you mm-hmm. and trust also but it's always there it's always been uh, yeah mm-hmm. how do you deal with self-doubt if you've had it how, or have you how have you ever dealt with it in terms of your creative work I think self-doubt is just it's one of the hazards of the job I don't think it ever goes away because it's to assume that you're at a space where your learning is done. I mean, I don't know if there are people who are like that, but for me especially, I'm always, I always feel like um, I'm not yet done learning. There's always something new to learn. There's always fantastic ways I can fail <laughs> and fantastic ways I can excel. And there's always something that I can pick from that. What I've managed to do with that self-doubt is, just to keep on practicing and comparing the works like what I've done here and what I've done then so staying away I mean sometimes it's there and I think it's difficult to go uh, when you look at what somebody else is doing and then you know you have the pangs of jealousy like a bad why then (laughs) of course that's always fed by (laughs) it's always fed by self-doubt like I'm much better and whatnot I think it's it's good to sometimes be aware of the egotistical nature of art because it's like I'm putting this out there and you know it's gonna be loved and I think there's nothing wrong with that but it is also comes from a place of like deep insecurity those are usually the pitfalls and I think are one of the occupational hazards that you just have to have forever Mm -hmm. but one of the ways to silence them is always to practice and never let it go too long before um, creating I mean of course if your mental space isn't there pay attention to that and deal with that but um, in terms of like you are able to write you're able to film you're able to do all of those things try to hone it and the the more practice you get, the better at it you get. Of course, there's always so much more to learn, but always just be open to that. The one thing, the one ethos I always go by is um, you can be wrong, and that's okay. And I think that is very good in terms of defining um, sometimes because I also believe that there's an arrogance in being a writer, like, but mm-hmm. uh, what do you mean? You know, <laughs> um, I can fail, please. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I think it's like, yeah, so when, you know, when you get back editor's notes, for instance, or you get back feedback from people who are interested in your work, and they're like, well, I don't know, you're like, well, I mean, actually consider it. Um, Exercise that sort of um, emotional intelligence, that critique of your own self, but don't fall into the whatever. It's like, yes, it can be wrong, and it's fine, and it can be better. And then finally, before you get stuck on this, I guess, there's now another pitfall where you get stuck in like rounds and rounds of revision, rounds and rounds of guessing yourself. Just put it out there and see. Just give yourself, like if you can, you're like, okay, draft one is done, draft two is done, draft three, it's there. But you know you've already done everything in your power to fix it as much as I can and then have the grace to give it out there and put it out. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's one way I've dealt with it. I don't know how you've dealt with it. I think other people are much better at, at handling things like that. For me, I would I would get back to it. I would say, okay, this self doubt is not doing me any good. So let me just do this work, and then I can I can cry about it later. I can come back to this later. <laughs> so, uh, because I mean that. Oh, I the shittiest run in the world! Oh my god! 
God. <laughs> of course, when you share these things or when you actually do these things, you find out that it, of course, it wasn't as bad as you think. Um, or some yeah, things didn't. Yeah. Some things also you just find out that you didn't need. They're not. You you find out that they're not good enough for yourself, right? So you're mm-hmm. like, you're like, but you had to sit down and do them and find that out you realize that you shouldn't have second guessed yourself to something that you're not even going to do anyways exactly oh my gosh a question just popped into my head and then popped out but i think you had already mentioned in the beginning who influenced you in writing unless you haven't oh no i hadn't in uh i haven't yet so uh, I mean, apologies to the. I am still there to the movement to decolonize ourselves. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I had gotten influenced actually a lot by um, classic British literature, and within the classic British literature, um, it was the writings of the Brontes, more specifically um, Charlotte and Emily Bronte. Mm-hmm. I really like the Gothic aspects of their work. I think and, um, the psychology of the mind, you know, what's happening, and of course now that shows in falling into thrillers and the maze and figuring out what's happening. <laughs> Those are the, the, I think, are two people who really influenced me in terms of writing. Mm-hmm. And then, do I have any other writer? No, actually, it just tends to be a lot of that. And I think sometimes it can be seen because I feel, I, I, don't, I honestly feel like it's influenced even how I speak sometimes because mm-hmm. I tend to be quite verbose and detailed and I'm like, but where are this words coming from? Oh my God, this is like blah, blah. <laughs> but it's because I'm reading it <laughs> at such a young age. Yeah. But in terms of like, so this is where it becomes very interesting in rather than the genre influence, I'm more influenced in how, especially when writing, it looks like to me when I saw it. So the works of, um, wow, really, I forgot his name. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, Dr. Troy's is let's think of his name, that guy. Everyone knows him. Yeah, everyone knows him. Him. We all know what you're talking about. Yes, the director. The, yeah, but how, how it all plays out um, on, on uh TV or in film, I'm really interested in how the characters navigate all of those things. So then both um, prose and cinema have influenced my writing. Um, quick what has influenced you, by the way, if you never said that you did and I wasn't listening? Ilya, what were your influences? Um, I mean, in terms of reading, I get, I get what you're talking about reading. I also started out reading a lot. We moved from Tanzania to Kenya uh-huh. when I was nine. And we, we weren't allowed to speak Swahili at home because my dad wanted to accelerate our English learning. And so one way one way to really be on top of everything was to read um, English books. And he I got my first like huge collection of Harry Potter books. Um and Oh lovely and, and goosebumps. What a fantastic introduction. I know. But I think it was a little bit more yeah. it, it, I, Actually, I think that one came later when he realized I really love books. The first one was Goosebumps. So Goosebumps, the the series of like the horror series. Yeah. Um, um, you know, bigger words. Uh, <laughs> uh, less. Uh-huh. You know, Harry uh-huh. Potter has this this really whatever fonts and like um, it's it 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 took me some time to get into them and to be able to sit a whole Harry Potter book out. Uh, but yeah, I think it was Goosebumps. Um, I was so obsessed with those. I remember two girls. Oh, one, one, one of my friends. So, so the first school that I went to was uh, Loreto Nsongari, the Catholic school. What? Yeah, I was there for three for three years, um, and and that was that was really when I fell in love with the series, but also just books and reading a lot. Those were my f- early influences. And I don't know why, I was such a wimp, you know, I would, like if I see, if I read about, I don't know, some, what is it called when someone bewitched, some bewitched eggs on like some, <laughs> some goosebumps uh, book, I would like have nightmares. <laughs> I would have nightmares, but I would still read the entire series. So I didn't know why I put the, those exactly. two together. Um, but that was great. Um, 
and then later on yeah then i switched to harry potter you know as you grow like the next year then the, the in thing is harry potter yeah. books so then you you do that um and then during i think when i was in uganda so for my all levels those um i don't know who wrote it but those a books book uh, mm-hmm. thing called maybe i'm pronouncing it wrong but it's sherab it was like uh, yeah, i can't remember now correctly but it was like these kids it was kind of like that movie with um with uh, you know that film where <laughs> where the girl has to choose i love it too <laughs> Two film interest people and we are like we don't know what Yeah. Um you know where she has to fight and choose like a tribe? Yes, divergent. Divergent, yes. So it's kind of like that. These kids who are in this institution called Cherub or Cherub. Um yeah, it was a really good series. Um so that was my O level phase. And then of course um A levels was all about Chimamanda. Oh my gosh. I read all Fifty Shades of Grey in one year. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, that was like in my first year. That was like 2013 and it was just like the hype everywhere. And then after that, really, I didn't have any specific things anymore. I would just love reading. I had this huge Oscar mm-hmm. Wilde collection that I got from like a yard sale in SA. Oh, it was so beautiful. Uh-huh. And there was like a note in it. You know how like secondhand books have all this history around it? There was like a note in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, of like, I don't know, a guy t- uh, thanking his neighbor for looking after the dog. And this person was using it as a bookmark. So I got it and I was like, oh my gosh, I love books. Wow. <laughs> I know. I was really happy to have read, the, there's a story called De Profundis which is, I don't know what, I, mean, I forget the translation in English. And it's a letter that Oscar Wilde wrote to this lover of his um, from prison. Oh my God. Up until that point, I hadn't read any actual personal um, emotions in books. You know, it was about series or getting the girl or things like that but that was i think the luckiest i'd ever gotten with books um i couldn't stop reading that letter it's long it was very many pages and um yeah it wasn't necessarily a love letter it was a a letter to tell him of how badly he felt he was treated by this guy so this love of his true story love of his like kind of took Uh advantage of his fame and his kindness and but oscar had kind of persevered through just because of love and he defended him Mm -hmm. and things like that but this guy never even like even in prison he came to see him once like he was just right like all these letters that he wrote about his frustrations but still in kindness right just still in very loving um and understanding terminologies but still kind of holding the mirror up to the guy and be like this is how you have been Mm -hmm. with me and with other people this is who you are as a lover as a person in this world and i just want you to know i mean it was so emotional I was like what am i reading people can do this and then ever since then i sought out books that um had a non-fiction thing to it or true story to it but also very very i mean catcher in the rye is also another thing where it's like very di- uh-huh. very differently written also i i love discovering completely different voices because that guy was i mean that's exactly what it was he was just talking right in that Uh other it was like the first time where i hadn't read like something that didn't seem like it was it it was gone over again and again and again to make it perfect i'm sure he he spent a lot of time in it but what jd salinger did in in that book was uh, was just genius I I I was just so happy. I know it's and then also just that yeah, thing yeah. of um mm-hmm. talking about like talking about yourself in the first person like I did this and I did that and I hate this person and I hate like I hadn't read things like that. I I just read she mm-hmm. and she did this or he and he does this. Um mm-hmm. so so reading that um kind of perspective was really great um 
I get it. I mean, it's like, you know, what's so fascinating about it. It's um, like a lot of the influences, I guess. Like, if, if somebody was to ask me, like I've just been asking, like, what are the influences on your work? And, I mean, I could name them, mm-hmm. but I also think it's very interesting that people should also realize there's a lot of stuff that influences writers that mm-hmm. you will actually never be able to see in their work. Yeah. At all. So I completely get like what you're talking about because for me, even last year, it was two books. It was Pachinko, mm-hmm. I forget the author, um, she's a Korean American author, and um, this book by Marlon James called The Book of Night Two Men, which just, wow, it was, it was a lot. And I, I think those books sometimes serve to remind us um, the power of what it is that you're doing. Mm-hmm. So, it's very interesting because I think sometimes a lot of people tend to now take the work and then um, place them on pedestals of this is the most important work or this one. So I really liked it how you were saying like, oh, I read Fifty Shades of Grey and then I also read Catcher of the Rye. I think that sort of spirit should be embraced, especially within the artistic community because I mean, I was the biggest um, trash YA reader, like young adult books. <laughs> Twilight. I even kept all my Twilight like oh a wrap. Oh my god! In, okay. I never <laughs> got to Twilight. <laughs> and I mean, a lot of people may say, okay, well, it's not really trash, but I mean, the way it's like described, you know, like, oh, you know, this is a trash book, or this is a whatever book, or whatnot. <laughs> right. It's like, okay, well, I mean, in context, it, it's a, it serves a very simple purpose, yeah. Yeah. perhaps, yeah. but it's in the enjoyment of the art and, exactly. and how exactly that impacts you. Yeah. That for me is the most important. Yeah, we yeah. just love words and, and we don't know, how, we don't care how they are written. If halfway we hate them, then we leave them, but we're not going to stop if something is out there <laughs> because that's just in our nature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I have to prepare for my class that's about 10. No problem. Thank you so much for making the time. We could have gone on for days because we're just getting into like that. Oh, for sure. Uh, book geeking out and, and writing stuff but yeah it's been very nice to catch up I have actually watched mm-hmm. up to um, the picture I was talking about the picture yes <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> that was us oh wow oh, on like wow. some non uniform fantastic day. isn't it I yeah. think your glasses were real and mine were fake but no one should know that <laughs> I know. No, I actually purported that mine were real just so that I could get away with coming to school with them. They were fake. They really? were so fake. I oh, I thought you wore glasses. Oh my gosh, my whole high school experience. I did, I did, but they were like really like geeky. Um, uh, those ones. Like the proper reading ones. Ah, yeah, yeah. But I, I wanted to wear this, so I wasn't... I mean, my, my set isn't that bad, but I didn't want to go with those specific ones. <laughs> yeah. This was business day. Yeah. Ah, yeah, business day. We had something like that. I forget. Why am I wearing like a cowboy? Not a cowboy, but like a. Do you know those guys who ride motorcycles? Uh, yeah. Uh, what are they called? <laughs> Anyways. Thank you so much. to drive motorcycles. That's their name. <laughs> you would think for writers oh. and readers, we'd just know the words for things. Uh, but then we kind of just forget you think. all right Annette oh, I don't want to keep you uh, please go prepare yeah. for your webinar thank you so much for making the time yeah okay. absolutely and I'm also looking forward like thank you so much for thinking about me she's actually said that had reached out to me and I was yeah. like absolutely oh my god Rukia where has she been <laughs> that's fantastic yeah. I mean I would uh, it's great like having this discussion I really thank really you. hope you can continue with this um, I enjoyed yeah. it you know you start to realize okay we're geeking out towards the end yeah it's true. <laughs> it's um true. yeah i'm looking i'm completely open for any type of collaboration that you want yeah. i'm open to going down to arusha like oh i'm God, so yes. for it okay fantastic yeah. let me think up brainstorm some stuff and i'll hit you up for sure all right okay thank you Rikia. Thank have you a fantastic so evening you too bye-bye